Hello everybody, Germ here and I must be mentally diseased because it is freezing outside and for some reason I'm making a video. So you left the cult and one of the first things you did was get rid of all your literature. Me too. I didn't have anywhere to take it anyway. I mean, I was on the verge of being homeless, uh, but it also felt really good to get rid of that. You know, it was vindicating. Dump those things in a trash bin. But now that I'm getting more active, I'm starting to regret not having all my old books anymore. So we're gonna go on a little trip today to see if we can't find any used witness books at the bookstore. Let's go. All right, we are in the religion section of the bookstore. Let's see if we can find any Watchtower books. Where would it be? Do they have a, a cult section? <laughs> Maybe that would be a little too on the nose. Probably Western religion, but what would they file it under? It's not like they have authors. Maybe, maybe Watchtower? Doesn't look like it. Russell, Rutherford, where are the R's here? Oh my gosh. I didn't know about this. Let's see what this is. Nope, wrong Russell. I don't see any Rutherford either. Eight old dudes in New York that control everything, but somehow they're not a cult. Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. Where are all the Watchtower books? Oh. I almost forgot. I work in books. I bet I know exactly where they are. Come on, follow me. There they are. The worst place that any book can find themselves in a used bookstore. The bottom of the street cards. Let me show you how they got there. To understand how a book ends up in the book graveyard, let's start out with how a used bookstore begins to even determine if they want a book or not. Um, a lot of books we can tell on site if we want, either they're popular or they're really eye-catching, but for things like this, we have to do a little bit of research. Uh, these days, most used bookstores are only able to survive by selling rare books online. In the age of Amazon and Kindles, where does a used bookstore go to sell rare books? Aha, yes. Embrace the dark side and sell right on Amazon. There's no way of getting around it. That's where people are buying books and they let us piggyback off of their success. So it'd be suicide not to take advantage of that. There are other places to sell online like eBay or A Books, but the first thing we want to know is if the book's available cheaply anywhere. And if it's going to be available cheaply, it's going to be on Amazon. So that's where we start. So the first thing we do is just search for that is bin code on the back. Oh. Wait, that's the thing about Watchtower literature. They don't use ISBINs. An ISBIN, International Standard Book Number, is like a book's social security number. It's that little code on the back that you'll find on most regular books. The number is linked to all of the book's metadata. It's used by booksellers and librarians to correctly identify the exact book that they're working with. That way they're not getting it mixed up with any other editions, publication dates, etc., etc. There are two reasons I can think of that Watchtower wouldn't use ISBINs. Number one, they have a bunch of slaves that will do all the distributing for them, so they're not really that concerned about making it easy for booksellers to deal with their books. And number two, not having an ISBN means that they can modify or change anything at any time without telling anybody. If they had ISBNs, they would have to register a new number every time they made a major change inside. So, isn't that convenient? Let me show you how that complicates things. So, say we're looking for Say we're looking for the 1987 Awake Bound volume. So we're going to type that in here. 1987 Awake Bound volume. All right, so we have one listing here for almost $100. However, no bookseller is going to know that this is called a bound volume. That's crazy witness talk. People call these periodicals now. So if you take out the bound volume and just search for 1987 Awake, now we get at least, we get three different listings here going for as low as $6. So we can tell now that these aren't really worth a whole lot of money. I mean, they're, I could search all of these one by one, but I know they're all going to end up with around the same, the same thing. If they had an ISBN to search with, we would only get one correct listing. Uh, so 
not having one makes it a lot more complicated for both the buyers and the sellers. So if our search came up with some astronomical number, like if that first entry was the only one we found, we'd then move on to double check prices on places like A Books and eBay, but we can see right here that it's only six bucks. At that price range, it's not that lucrative for your traditional mom and pop bookseller to bother trying to sell online. A lot of the listings you see for like dollar books or penny books, those are coming from great big warehouses that make all of their money off of the shipping costs and the sheer volume of books that they ship. Uh, so that's great for them, but for your regular old bookstore, not that exciting. And I'll tell you, 99.99% of Watchtower literature you find online is going to be priced around the same thing. Even a lot of the older books that are out of print that, you know, most witnesses don't even know about, they're, they're dirt cheap. One of the few exceptions to this is surprisingly like my book of Bible stories. The hardcover is actually fairly expensive to get, at least in very good condition. This is probably because they replaced the hardcover with a paperback, which probably doesn't stand up to drooling kids as well as the hardcover does. So of any online listings, I imagine that's the only one that actual witnesses are willing to fork over cash for. A nice durable copy for their kids. So now that we've eliminated the idea of selling this online, the next question is, is it going to sell in store? And here is the thing. Western religion is hands down one of the worst selling sections in a bookstore. Christians really like to be right about stuff and they're not really that interested in hearing what the other crazy denominations have to say. This is in stark contrast to sections like Buddhism or Zen, which fly off the shelves fast and we can keep them stocked. To sell out of Western religion, you have to really stand out. You gotta have an eye-catching cover, you need to be vague enough to encompass any kind of denomination, and it helps to be popular. And there was a time when someone would pick up a witness book out of curiosity and be like, oh yeah, I'd like to live forever on a paradise earth, that sounds great. And these days, people react the same way to this that they do to this. So why are Watchtower books so cheap in the first place? There's a few reasons that I'm sure that you probably already know. Witnesses like to highlight, underline, and mark the crap out of their books, which is uh, high treason. And it's really all about supply and demand. The only people looking for witness books are witnesses. And they're specifically told not to look into other religions, so they're not gonna be caught dead over here in this section. Not to mention any of their current relevant literature, New Light, is available for free at any Kingdom Hall. So that means the only market for old Watchtower books is apostates. And it's not even all apostates, it's only the apostates that are activists and apostates that happen to throw out all their literature and miss having their literature or they're missing a certain book. That's uh, not much of a market. And the longer that the book sits on a shelf, the more the price plummets. And so they end up here. These are where we put books we don't want, can't use, don't care, what happens to them. Those bound volumes have been in the carts for about three months now, selling for 50 cents a pop. That go to charity, nobody wants them. What I think is the most interesting though is where the books come from. That's kind of the coolest thing about working with used books is going through someone's old library and trying to piece together an image of what that person is like just from their books. We do get some donations from witnesses that are downsizing. I'm assuming that these are people that are simplifying their life to become an auxiliary pioneer or you know, going to Bethel, becoming a circuit overseer, you know, whatever. Uh, we actually had a donation from a professor that was writing a book about gullibility, and he had a whole section in there on witnesses and how they get people to believe the crazy things they believe. And then there is the deceased estate. These are huge donations from someone that had just passed away. Of the witness variety, it's always the same story. It's always some distant relative that's bringing in the books or having us go pick them up that, you know, they didn't really know the deceased that well. They were always really distant, had cut off both the family. They were really into their religion, but they never had kids, so there was no one else left to clean up the house. Guess it's me. These are books that came from people that lived their whole lives for the organization and died expecting a resurrection that's never going to come. Those donations hit me really hard when I'm going through the books and I see all their highlights and underlining and their little notes in the margins for the comments that they were planning to make at the meeting and I try to piece together an image of the person that they were or I can picture them at the Kingdom Hall. And it's just really sad, you know? They had the best intentions. They meant so well and where did all that end up? In the street cart of a used bookstore. When I was very young, 10 years old, we saw the photodrama of creation. 
and it was just packed with people. They were even standing in the back. We were so thrilled, we never forgot it. And we realized that we found the truth. Well, I played the tenor banjo, tenor guitar, and I played the mandolin. It was my life. And yet, uh, when I began reading and studying, really, the, I wanted to stick with that, and I left the band. Well, I started pioneering then, September 1948. January 1952. The 1935. The missionaries for 47 years. The World's War Two was on, and uh, well, we thought the end was nearby. That was 1st of February, 1943. Distractions come in all shapes and sizes. I'm working down in the laundry, folding, same. Folding and folding till we fold in. I go out as much as I can. We want to help the people to see the truth. Distractions. I've been able to keep full-time service as my career. When one looks back over the years, we know we've, we've taken the best course of life. Every human has exactly the same number of hours and minutes in each day. And I hope everybody who is young, he will do the same because he, he will miss something. Where would we be today if we hadn't taken up full-time service? We can never recoup the time we have wasted. Wasted. Well, giving my life to Jehovah, that's the best thing I could do for myself. If I have any advice for young ones today, I would say to keep on the truth. They have a whole world before them to serve Jehovah, something that endures forever.